Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul here with Radio Free Hammer Hall, doing a little bit of an interesting math hammer today. Uh, we're going to talk about Skaven, the Rat Trap, and setting the Rat Trap. In other words, um, what wizards are the best choice for setting the Rat Trap? And in addition to that, just sort of analysis of the wizards in general. Uh, and the Warp Lightning Vortex in general. So, what is the Rat Trap? Basically, it centers around the Warp Lightning Vortex. The, the Vortex does a combination of things. It uh, debuffs enemy movement within range of it, uh, and it also has the potential to be dealing out mortal wounds to the things that are in range of it. Uh, it has a casting value of 8, so it is difficult to cast and even more difficult to unbind or dispel. Um, this is typically combined with <coughs> excuse me, uh, other movement debuffs as well as shooting so you can take advantage of things sitting in one place without getting your own units uh, subject to the damage of the Vortex. So let's look at the Warp Lightning Vortex itself. Consists of three models, casts on an eight. You set up the first one wholly within 26 inches of the caster, and then the two other models exactly seven inches from the first model and seven inches from each other. So we're making a seven by seven by seven equilateral triangle with those. So what does this do? The warp lightning bolts, uh, when the model is set up and at the end of each movement phase, roll a die for each unit that is within six inches of any of the models of the endless spell, add one to that roll if the unit's within six inches of two of the models, add two to the roll if it's within a uh, distance of all three. So on a four up, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So if it's within all three, that is on a two up, then it suffers D3 mortal wounds. And on an unmodified roll of six, it does D6 mortal wounds instead of D3. In addition, units cannot run or fly when they make a normal move that starts within six inches of any of the models in this endless spell. So it slows down uh, the ability to get out of the way. And that inability to fly is also key because it makes you move around the models in the Warp Lightning Vortex, so rather than being able to fly over them, which is kind of critical, I think. So, let's just do some quick math on the measurements and geometry of this thing. Well, the next model is not going to be that simple, but this is the, the basics. You have a 26-inch range, so you can... If you have your wizard on your 12-inch line, you can uh, definitely hit the enemies with that 26-inch range. You don't even really need to do it that far, necessarily. It may be more advantageous to have it a little bit closer to you so it covers more of the battlefield area rather than just the deployment zone. Uh, so you have seven inches between each pylon, so you can extend the effective range up to 33 inches if you uh, continue that line straight across. And then the additional six inch radius of the pylon extends it to a 39 inch effective range. Uh, and that's not including the bases, so it's a couple of extra inches onto that as well. It's probably more like 41 or 42 inches. Uh, because they're on 40 millimeter bases. Whew! Okay, so that just gives you an idea of how far you can pitch this thing in general. Uh, you can hit a large portion of the battlefield with this from, you know, wherever your wizard happens to be casting from. 
So the effective area of this thing, I did some math, broke out the uh, old geometry book. So this is basically what it looks like. The pylons are seven inches from each other, and then they have a six inch radius around them. So you'll see that between the three pylons, there is an area where all three uh, intersect, and there's some pretty substantial area where two intersect. Uh, and then you have even bigger bubbles where there is just one uh, that is potentially affecting enemy models. So the total uh, dimensions of this thing, um, you know, across the widest part of this, it's 27.6 inches. And across the most narrow piece of this, it is 23.9 inches. So that just gives you an idea of just how much board space we're looking at. One sixth of the board, you know, if we cut all of this into, uh, you know, the six 24 inch square pieces, this is basically taking up most of uh, one sixth of the board. So like you're kind of shutting off a whole 24 by 24 tile of the board. Which is a, a, not shutting off, but it's affecting a re that area very substantially. So casting this thing. Uh, we have a lot of good options for casting. Uh, the Gray Seer and Thankful, they can cast on D3, uh, 3D6, dropping the lowest die. Our Scryer Warlocks, the Arch Warlock, Warlock Engineer, and Warlock Bombardier, they can all use a Warpstone Spark to re-roll their casting values. Lord Screech has a once-per-game ability to have a plus one to cast for that turn. And the Gracier on a Screaming Bell, uh, when he rolls a seven on the Peel of Doom, gets plus one to cast for everything within the radius of the Peel of Doom. Your Master Clan heroes can take the Master of Magic command trait, which gives them an additional plus one to cast. And all of your gnaw holes are arcane terrain, giving you another potential plus one to cast. So that's a lot. So, and there's a lot of different math here. So I made a table just kind of rolling through what all of our options are here. I did not include the Peel of Doom because it's very unreliable. So you don't really want to bank on that being the thing to get you there. So one of your just base casters without using any buffs. 41.7% uh, chance to cast. Not very good. Um, if you have some buff giving it plus one, it becomes a 58.3% chance. And plus two, so having Master of Magic and an arcane piece of terrain, for example brings that up to 72.2. Now, looking at Thankwool and the Gray Seer on foot, their base is going to be 68% on that particular roll. If they get plus one to cast, it moves up to 80.5. And plus two to cast becomes 89.3. Now, it's important to note here that Thankwool cannot... Uh, get that plus two to cast because he is unique and cannot take the Master of Magic command trait. And then our re-rolls, our base is 66%. So roughly two thirds of the time you're going to be able to cast that. Um, and then with a plus one to cast, it goes to 82.6%. And unfortunately, there's no combination other than including the Peel of Doom that gives you plus two to cast and a reroll. So ranking these possibilities, 
the best option is a gray seer on foot with master of magic standing next to a gnaw hole that gives you your best chance to cast the warp lightning vortex and really any spell the scryer warlock uh, standing next to a, a gnaw hole and using a warp stone spark is your number two. Now, that was surprising to me. That's why I titled this the unintuitive results, because this is not at all what I would have expected it to be before I did the math, which makes me really glad I did the math. Uh, I think the Gracier with the Master of Magic and gnaw hole was... That is the intuitive best answer, but the rest of this is kind of surprising to me. Um, it, this was not intuitive math for me anyway. Now, number three is a gray seer with Master of Magic or a gnaw hole or thankful with a gnaw hole. That is uh, interesting that, you know, the gray seer is one and three. Um... So potentially just a gray seer, you know, with no additional investment standing next to a gnaw hole is actually a pretty good option for casting that. Now, as I'll note later on, uh, the gray seer may blow himself up in the process. Uh, number four is, you know, your vermin lords or, you know, any of your other casters not using buffs. Uh, with Master of Magic and a Gnaw Hole. And then we go to Gray Seer or Thankwool without buffs. Then the Scryer Warlock with just a Warp Stone. Then a Vermin Lord with Master of Magic or a Gnaw Hole. Or Lord Screech with just uh, his once per game ability. Uh, and then finally our Unbuffed Wizards. So that's a lot of options here to get this thing cast. And I would say basically any of the top four are pretty solid options. Um, but, you know, in a minute we'll talk about my preferences. So, as I mentioned first, uh, that Gracier blows himself up when he rolls a 13 on the 3d6 before you uh, drop the lowest. When you buff this, that becomes more likely because you're potentially getting you're you're getting buffs towards that thirteen. The gray seer is also just a, a five wound, five up save hero. He's really fragile, um, and between the the possibility of him blowing himself up and uh, him just getting sniped off the table. It makes me really reluctant to put an artifact or a command trait on him because he might not survive. Um, Warpstone Sparks, they may injure the caster. Uh, Lord Screech is once per game and... Lord Screech and Thankwool uh, both cannot take Master of Magic because they're unique. Um, so that's definitely a downside for those two, making them kind of suboptimal for being your caster here. Um, and personally, I just kind of don't like Thankwool in general. He, I don't own the model, and I don't plan to buy it. Just my two cents on that. Maybe if he comes down in points. So, here is my personal preferences. Take it or leave it, this is how I feel about it. The Peel of Doom is super unreliable, but I'm generally going to be running a Screaming Bell in my army, so I'm perfectly happen, happy when I roll a 7 and I get that plus 1 to cast. 1 in 6 shot, so it's quite possible that you'll have games when this buff won't happen at all. And it's pretty unreliable to get this on the particular turn that you want to cast a Warp Lightning Vortex, or in particular, any spell that you happen to really want to get off. So, your Gray Seer is technically your best casting option, but you have to 
put a command trait on a hero that is otherwise kind of unimpressive, fragile. You don't really want to get him up into the fray, so his ability to do things is somewhat limited. You really need to kind of keep him protected. And that's a problem. His spell on his War Scroll, uh, Wither, is actually really good, except it only has a 13-inch range. He is a Gray Seer, so you can give him an additional spell. Uh, but all things considered, I am very hesitant to put a Gray Seer in my list, particularly putting a Command Trait on him. Uh, as I already mentioned, Thankful is really overpriced for what he does, I think. And your general vermin lords are, you know, they, they rank kind of in the middle of the pack for casting. You have to stack Master of Magic and sitting next to a gnaw hole to get them to have a reasonable chance of casting it regularly. So that leaves us with the three Scryer Warlocks. Um... I'm likely already putting these in my list anyway. Personally, I like to run a lot of Scryer stuff in my list. The Warpstone Sparks are really powerful, and a lot of the Scryer stuff is just really good anyway. Um, and he doesn't require any additional investment other than using Warpstone Sparks. Um, he may damage himself using the Warpstone Sparks, but it's not guaranteed. But he's also going to be sitting around doing a lot of other support tasks in addition to casting a Warp Lightning Vortex. Um, more, more, more Warp Power is a very good spell. Um, the artifacts you can take for him are good. The other uh, Warp Stone Spark ability to add plus one damage to your, uh, you know, up to three friendly units uh, within range is also very good. So running a pretty heavy Scryer list, I think, is good. And since you don't need to invest anything else into that Scryer Warlock, um, I think that's really your go-to option for who you want to have casting your... Warp Lightning Vortex. So, which one you take is kind of up to you. The Arch Warlock does give you a more beefy character with um, a double cast. The Bombardier gives you only one casting, but he's much cheaper and he does have that very effective shooting attack. Well, not very effective, I wouldn't really say, but he has a shooting attack that's kind of scary and once in a while is going to splash around a decent amount of damage. Um, and then you have your regular engineer, which is not particularly impressive, but certainly is, um, you know, an adequate option to add as well. And in terms of just acquiring the thing, you know, your engineers are a lot cheaper to pick up than the Bombardier at the moment. So, that said, uh, that's the overall analysis. Those are my picks. Um, you know, if you really want to go all in, it's prob the Gray Seer is probably your best option. Otherwise, Clan Scryer is going to do very good things for you in getting that Warp Lightning Vortex cast. And all of your other spells in general cast as well. Uh, he is just... Those Scryer Warlocks are really good. So, that is all for now. Um, this was definitely very insightful for me. Hopefully it helps out some other people. And, uh, you know, since the Rat Trap is already, you know, underperforming in tournaments, I say sarcastically... Um, this might give people uh, a little bit more of an edge in how to do that more effectively. All right, kids, I will talk to you all later.